Well, <clears throat> I come at the war, I published a, a book a few years ago looking at the War of 1812 and the rebellions of 1837-38 uh, in Lower Canada, and I focused on the eastern townships because it's an area that has not been, no attention has been paid to it despite the fact that it was right on the American border. Uh, one of the reasons is there was no fighting, or nothing significant anyway, um, uh, in that region uh, for various reasons, either during the war or the rebellions. But uh, to get onto the war, I th uh, and to stick with the townships for a second, and then I'll broaden out, but um, that was an area settled by Americans after the revolution, not primarily loyalists, but Americans who came up for land. And so they're settling there in the 1790s after 1800, and then this war breaks out, uh, and one would expect that they would sympathize with their cousins, their relatives, their neighbors, where they came from across the border. Uh, but in fact, that didn't happen. Um, so I was interested in the war from a social, cultural perspective rather than a military, political one. And I think, again, the townships is a good um, study area to look at how the impact uh, how it impacted identity. If, if I switched to Upper Canada for a second, a lot of work has been done uh, by an earlier generation historians like Sid Wise and so on, who argue that uh, the 1812 war created this kind of Tory conservative uh, uh, Canadian, uh, well, sensibility or ideology or identity, if you want to call it that, because the family compact kind of emerges out of that. And this myth that Canadians played a major role in defeating or, or pushing back the Americans developed uh, from that period. And um, so uh, I thought that it would be useful to switch, you know, because nobody had looked, despite all the hundreds of books that have been written on the 1812 war, mostly from a military perspective, and many of them, of course, focusing on the United States, uh, to look at what happened on the lower Canadian side. Um, and. Um, I, I argue that in a way it, it was a test of, I wouldn't exactly call it loyalty, but in a way I think the people in that region, and I think it's the same for Upper Canada, were neither loyal to the United States nor Britain. In the townships what they did was they resisted American uh, forays across the border because what was happening was uh, livestock from a, in, uh, North New England states was being smuggled across the border towards Montreal to feed the British Army, because in Vermont and those places, they were against the war to start with, right? And of course, these people are going to, whatever, whatever it takes to make money. And so there was this, they, the Americans fed the British Army, which is the irony. And a lot of that, that, those lives, that livestock went across the border. The American military then tries to prevent that from happening. And so you have skirmishes along the border. They cross the border and, you know, arrest people who are, perhaps, and they, you know, helping the Americans and so on. So there are all those little skirmishes. But what I found was that when there were, there was a, a kind of a call for the militia to, you know, to take up arms, uh, they, they did so enthusiastically. Uh, but when uh, what we would call, I suppose, um, conscription uh, was introduced in which each militia unit was supposed to choose a couple of men to go off to, to St. John's on the Richelieu uh, to fight with the British Army, uh, they absolutely refused. And so I think what was happening is that they were prepared to defend their homes. You know, their, their, in other words, their worldview is very local. Um, neither British nor American, they just want to protect their their families, their farms, their communities, and so they're sure if they if the, if they're asked to join the militia for that purpose they'll do it. If they're asked to join the militia to do it, to do anything outside their immediate area, uh, they're not interested. So what does that say about Canadian identity? Well, I, I think in a way you know it shows that that, that it took uh, at that period that early settlement period it certainly hadn't developed yet, and that there wasn't a strong uh, loyalty to the British either. Uh, there's a kind of opportunism. Um, George Shepard, I think, um, wrote a book a few years ago, a very interesting book on Upper Canada, where he showed that when the Americans invaded and, you know, took over York and so on, um, lots and lots of Upper Canadian men went and turned themselves in as prison, well, gave up, uh, because the Americans couldn't put them all in a, you know, concentration camp or whatever, so what they did was they made them sign a, an agreement 
uh, not to fight for another year. And that's what these men wanted, because if they signed that agreement, then the British couldn't make them fight. Right, so there was no loyalty to, to the British or maybe, you know, I mean, they, they probably would have helped to resist uh, invasion in their, in their own communities, but certainly not, uh, not a sense of participating in a kind of a, a war between two nations. Uh, that was not what they were interested in doing. So that's a long rambling answer, but it's the beginning of an answer. I think, you know, in many ways it helped create this family compact the elite in Upper Canada and helped to start the myth of this Canadian conservative uh, nationalism, if you want to call it that. Um, and I would say even in the eastern townships, it's the beginning of that because, you know, once you've resisted American attacks and so on, then you, then, and once you've participated in what was a, you know, a larger event, even if it's only at a local level, I suspect that that brought, brought people a little bit outside their comfort zones in their own you know, rural communities, but that's hard to say. I mean, my another book I wrote, which was looking at missionaries, um, British missionaries in the region for the Anglican Church and the Wesleyan Methodist Church, argues that those missionaries were key to changing that uh, kind of pro-American or American identity into a, a, for lack of a better word, a Canadian one, uh, because religion is all very important to one's identity, of course, in the early 19th century, to one's whole worldview. And these Congregationalists, you know, former Puritans come in from New England, um, and because they didn't have many missionaries at the 1812 war, broke those uh, circuits, that, those religious circuits between New England and Lower Canada. Uh, and any missionary that went across the border would be arrested. So the British uh, missionaries fill that vacuum. And after the war is over, the Americans are more interested in sending their missionaries westward to their own west. They're, they think of upper, upper and Lower Canada as hostile territory as a result of that war. So there's that vacuum, which um, the uh, Society for the Propagation of the Gospel out of London for the Church of England and uh, the Wesleyan Missionary Society fill. And when you think about it, they establish Sunday schools, they provide religious services, they build churches. Um, they basically convert by, 18, by the middle of the 19th century. 80% of the population in that region are either Anglican, most of them Anglican, but a lot of them are Wesleyan Methodist. And those were very conservative missionaries, very anti-American. So I argue that Canadian historians have been very slow to look at religious history on contrast to the United States because probably because we're a much less religious people than the Americans are. Um, but that if you really want to understand the early 19th century, um, you have to look at religion. And from a broader perspective, religion plays a very important role. <laughs>